Welcome, my name is Nally Rodriguez and I'm the docent coordinator here at the North Carolina Executive Mansion. I am so excited to present the Executive Mansion to you today because this is a phenomenal space that reveals a significant aspect of North Carolina's history, crafts, and governors who have served the state. As a historic building with over 120 years of history and being an active living residence for state governors and their families, this house has gone through some major changes. It looks very different from when it opened in 1891. This is the third official residence for governors in the state of North Carolina. In 1792, after Raleigh was established as the permanent capital of North Carolina, all other executive homes would remain in Raleigh. That same year, a two-story frame building off Fayetteville and Hargett Street was purchased to be the first home for North Carolina's chief executives. In 1816, the Governor's Palace was built in a neoclassical style architecture. After the Civil War, due to lack of care to the Governor's Palace, Governor Thomas Jarvis suggested that the legislative invest in a more suitable living arrangement for chief executives. The construction of the house began in 1883 Samuel Sloan and his assistants, Adolphus Bauer, were selected as the architects. It took eight years in the labor of North Carolina inmates and many state natural resources to build the mansion. Like the great oaks, pines, sandstones, and many other natural resources that come from the state. In 1891, the mansion would be completed and Governor Daniel Fowle would be the first governor to occupy this space. We begin our tour today in the grand entrance is 76 feet long and 19 feet wide. The first item you see when you enter this space is a carpet that commemorates the first 100 years of governors in this mansion from 1891 to 1991. In the grand entrance, we're surrounded by 11 portraits of past sitting governors, like Governor Fowle, the first governor to reside in the mansion, as well as portraits of our last two chief executives. There is only one portrait in the mansion that is not of a governor or first lady. It is a portrait of David Haywood. He was an African-American man who served as a butler in the mansion for over 50 years. That would be 14 consecutive terms ending with Governor Greg Cherry. The grand staircase is behind me. It has 24 steps and the banister is covered with the wonderful hand-carved oak leaf decorations and symbolism of the city of Raleigh, also known as the city of Oaks. The first two rooms as you enter the grand entrance are the gentleman's parlor and the ladies' parlor. The gentleman's parlor is to your right when you enter the house. It has several items on display that symbolize North Carolina, like our official state bird, the Cardinal. I also stand on top of a rug that has four significant events in North Carolina's history on every corner. The first would be Hernando de Soto, who reached North Carolina mountains in 1540 during his exploration. Second would be the first colony on Roanoke Island, a Sir Walter Raleigh expedition that would later be known as the Lost Colony. The third corner represents UNC Chapel Hill, which opened its doors as the first state-supported university in the U.S. in 1795. And finally, on the last corner are the Wright brothers, who were the first of powered flight at Kitty Hawk. The ballroom was originally a music room and was on the second floor. During World War I, the ballroom was filled with cots of soldiers traveling through Raleigh. So, eventually, the music room would be converted into a dancing space for patriotic groups. As you look around this space, you'll see that there is 14 karat gold leaves that were applied in the 90s. Today, this room is used to host meetings, press conferences, and music at the mansion. Shine like gold. This space is the library and is also the home office to our governor, where he hosts meetings and interviews. In this room, we have wonderful crafts from artisans from all across the state. Behind me are two bookshelves that were commissioned by Governor Sanford. These bookshelves were created by Pug Moore Jr. of Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Each one of these bookshelves contained books written by North Carolina authors or books about North Carolina. On top of these bookshelves, there are busts of Sir Walter Raleigh, as well as George Washington. Another piece of furniture in this room that highlights the crafts in North Carolina is this cabinet right here. 
This cabinet was created by Thomas Day. He was a master craftsman here in North Carolina. He was a free man of color who owned a craft shop in Milton, North Carolina. This was a phenomenal achievement for a man of color here in the state of North Carolina, especially in the antebellum South. Today, this cabinet houses crafts from artisans all across the state of North Carolina. We have crafts from Cherokee potters as well as African American potters in here. We are now in the dining room. The dining room seats 24 people and today is used for governor's meetings, to host dinner parties. We also can find many aspects of North Carolina symbolism in this room. From the fine silver behind me to the fine china we have that also commemorates the first hundred years of the mansion. One of the more notable items in this room is the chandelier. The chandelier has a very interesting story. During the Nazi regime in Europe during World War II, Ms. Horchowitz, her husband, and son fled Europe to avoid execution. In 1944, they made their way to Western North Carolina. After the war, Ms. Horchowitz inquired about her home back in Europe. Many of her possessions were gone, but what remained was a chandelier and a family tapestry. Because of the kindness the Horchowitz family received here in North Carolina, they gifted the state with the chandelier. This hallway commemorates the first spouses of the mansion. In 2009, Beverly Perdue would be the first female governor of North Carolina. Because of that, her husband, Robert Eves, would be the first male spouse of the executive mansion. We are now in the ladies' parlor, which is also the first room to the left when you enter the mansion. Some people call it the pink room, given its color. This space was used by ladies early on in the mansion's history to come talk and speak on other matters when they would leave the dining room. One of the more notable portraits in this house of a first lady is of Danelle Moore behind me. It hangs here because she is credited for bringing elegance back to the mansion during her husband's term. Ms. Moore created the Executive Mansion's Fine Arts Committee. The Executive Fine Arts Committee is still around today and they continue to raise private funds to support the collections we have in the mansion today. Thank you so much for visiting the Executive Mansion today and we hope to see you soon.